Okay, everybody, we're going to get started. Um, first, I'll make an announcement, then Alice will make an announcement, then Robert will do the intro, and then we'll go from there. We'll go from chat. Okay, so uh, welcome again, everybody. Thanks thank you for coming. Uh, we we uh, are very excited to have, to have you guys here and have chat here. And uh, I wanted to also mention we have another one scheduled coming up March 8th, uh, David and Elroy Air. I mentioned this last month. Um, a different type of autonomous vehicle that, that kind of flies. So that'll be interesting to hear what their plans are. And um, Allison, come on up. Thanks very much, uh, Greg and Nissan, for hosting the event yet again and uh, generously providing refreshments. Um, just wanted to mention that our next event at Ford with Edward Durney is talking about standardized software platform for autonomous vehicles is unfortunately sold out. We're going to have another event on March 28th with Gerno Heiser from Australia, who's uh, really the author of the first formally validated real-time operating system for microcontrollers. His software is in a lot of uh, nuclear power plants and uh, aircraft, and he's going to speak to the group on March 28th in a location which I haven't found yet. So if your company would like to host that meetup on March 28th, and you have room for 50 or so people, please uh, speak to me after the event. Tonight, uh, we are very excited to have a talk about uh, simulation as a service. And to introduce the speaker, we're going to have Robert Seidel of Lotus Ventures, who is a longtime friend of the group. Thank you, Allison. Thank you, Rick, for having us here. It's, uh, this is always the best space. You can actually breathe in this space versus some of the other ones we go to. That's great. Um, quick introduction. So um, I've been talking about simulation for a long time. <clears throat> it's actually been ramping up dramatically the last uh, couple of years. Um, specifically, uh, we see a change from driving simulation, where humans are in the middle of it, or hardware simulation, or CAE, computational fluid dynamics, that kind of simulation towards sensor simulation, which is very different. We'll hear about that today, how that's different. But as you can imagine, a lot of these AVs that are driving around, think about you know the, the Waymo car or the, the, the cruise car that's driving around in San Francisco that has 12 cameras, seven lighters, 20 radars on it. That's a lot of sensors. Um, if you need to validate the software stack that's running inside there, you can't just drive around every, uh, every time to revalidate it. Let's say firmware from Velodyne changes or the DrivePX uh, platform changes or somebody says your sensor has to, has to change position so your field of view is different. You need to validate that again. Validation is, is hard because you have to drive thousands of miles. Um, that's what this problem, but that's the problem that this company addresses. Um, and you need to do that at a very large scale. Just to give you an idea, these numbers are public. Uh, Google drives about two million, sorry, Waymo drives about two million miles a year with one vehicles, about 100 vehicles uh, around Arizona and here and everywhere. They simulate two and a half billion miles a year. That's over a thousand times as much in simulation. So simulation is going to play a very, very key role uh, in validating, in developing, in testing, and in training um, these, these autonomous vehicles. And that's what this company is about. Uh, we helped start it um, about a year ago. Um, we were looking for competent uh, uh, you know, uh, executives to run it. And actually, I was very happy to find one of the editors of mine uh, back in the days when we were writing UAV software, so were they, um, and we were competing. Um, and uh, they ended up being bought by Boeing. And so after they uh, rotated out of there, let's say, I was eager to, to see whether we could start something together. And that's how this company started. Where's Jack? Here he is. So with that, I don't think I need any more because you're going to say all the rest, right? So this is Chad Partridge. I'll give you the mic. I, I think uh, I think I'm good here. Can everybody hear me well? Yeah. Great. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Rob. Appreciate it. Uh, Greg, thanks to thank you, Greg. Thank you, Allison. Uh, not sure where you went. Uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, to speak here at this at this event. Uh, thanks a lot, Juan, also for building this uh, and help, helping me get set up with everything. So. Uh, and a great introduction uh, by, by Robert. Yes, indeed, we have a, a long history, and he has been very helpful with Metamoto, and uh, thanks for that, too. Um, and 
without further ado, our topic here is autonomous system simulation as a service. So we've been at this for a few years. Uh, the premise, you know, in some ways we'll start from the beginning, but I hope by now that what I'm going to talk about is plainly obvious to a lot of you, whereas a few years ago, it was not. Um, and the thesis of starting Metamoto was that the needs for simulation for autonomous vehicles was just simply different than the previous needs of traditional simulators. Uh, automotive simulation is not necessarily something new. Um, hardware in the loop, driver in the loop uh, simulation has existed for some time. But in this process, uh, somewhere along the line of shifting, from autonomous, uh, shipping to autonomous systems, from traditional driving, business as a whole became more of a software business than a hardware business. At least that's where the short term focus is when you're talking about machine learning, when you're talking about, uh, when, when you're talking about loads of variations that human drivers have been very adept at over the years. And, uh, you know, some of the things that we noted very early on was that physical testing, doing 30 tests a day, was simply not going to be enough. Um, that uh, development was going to require continuous test validation. So I'm going to bring up that, you know, this concept of software engineering quite a bit. Uh, continuous integration, continuous test, uh, best practices of software engineering, unit and functional testing that, uh, that needed to find their way into uh, the autonomous system landscape. And with that, uh, simulation uh, in the type that I'm talking about is a natural parent. Um, Robert had talked very early about sensor simulation, how that's different than anything that's been done before. The use of sensors are just um, you know, prevalent. They're, they're just being used in a different way now. And uh, they're being used for very critical functions. And sensor simulation is very important. And uh, I'm going to revisit this also in this machine learning context, uh, that more than ever, without a true understanding of how the system is cha uh, changing and being trained, you have to test at a scale that was never uh, done before. So our thesis is that more than ever before, simulation was going to be a core part of the design, development, test, and validation cycle, the life cycle, and, uh, and that a built-to-purpose solution that was autonomous, scalable, parameterized, was just going to be needed over what there was today. Uh, you know, you see, you see a lot of simulations, uh, you know, I won't identify any, you know, one company by name, but it was a very workstation-based simulation approach that to be able to scale it, you would be able to, you would have to take hundreds of laptops and, uh, and, and parallelize them. And there's software that attempts to do that but nothing addresses it like the cloud and the capability that that now gives us. So, uh, uh, Metamoto's simulation as a service, uh, our, our entire approach is that it pairs with your uh, you know, development, your agile workflow environment, uh, your continuous integration environment. We have two great examples here of Jira and Jenkins. Your uh, we're testing all of the autonomous system software in the cloud virtually. So you're bringing in all of the software for your system, all the various subcomponents, uh, building an ecosystem. Eventually, you'll have sensor companies providing their sensor models to OEMs and performing who are going to be performing the simulations. And those sensor models are going to be almost as important as the sensors themselves, that that's going to become a critical part of the sensor package to be able to si simulate it. And we'll talk more about why that is. And then also integrating with your requirements management. But the view overall is your code changes get pushed, uh, whereas your system and functional tests would usually run in a software engineering context. We're running all the simulations at scale, uh, running you know millions of them in a cycle. Uh, for example, Google Carcraft was a big part of validating this simulation space. You may have all read the Atlantic uh, article regarding Carcraft. Um, 
big part of validating, you know, on the last slide, that I'd like to think that a lot of these things, that I see a lot of nodding heads and people that say, yeah, in a lot of ways, there really is an understanding that A-B simulation is a critical factor, and that's very important now. But Google was, uh, even as, back as far back as 2014, were running millions of tests a night. Uh, this is a capability that a, a lot of the other car companies did not have, and thus, a company like Metamoto bringing that forward uh, to them. And then it's also our premise that simulation is also going to become uh, a, a standard, a, a, a key part of standards going forward, and that there's going to be an expectation of auditability, auditability of simulations that you're going to be storing all of your results over time and cross-correlating not only changes that uh, were made in the latest code base, but that people can go back in and say, oh my, oh my goodness, this happened. Did you test against that years ago? Very important piece. So I'm going to identify a couple of uh, three key use cases uh, for uh, for simulation software. Um, a developer making changes, let's say, to their controller, uh, making individual changes. They push, uh, they they run their set of simulations, and I'm going to address this in the context of our results analyzer. But they want to use simulation to be able to pour through the stack of how their changes, what, what their changes, the effects that that had on the system and debugging those. And then ultimately, you know, feeding back into their development cycle. Very, very akin to what you would expect from modern compiler uh, development type environment. Uh, the, the next use case is your entire team makes all their changes. Per, uh, changes are made to the training data for the perception stack. Uh, controller changes are made. You apply a new sensor model. All of these things are pushed and comprehensively, your you know, up to millions of simulations in a cycle are run in the evening. Your QA team comes in early and they can uh, you know they get various notifications and the team can go forward, you know, based on the ramifications of all of these changes. Uh, and then lastly, you're you know working on a specific simulation and you realize that you find a scenario that's of unique interest that you say, oh, that's not covered in our scenario database, or that is not, uh, we're not training against that. You can pull out uh, data sets for machine learning purposes, even out of the simulator, uh, very high photo uh, quality results that you can contribute back into your training data sets and train against those in the future. All throughout time, you're adding to your scenarios, improving specific scenarios, adding scenarios, and your coverage for your simulation is increasing. So uh, I mentioned machine learning, real key part of, of this, and a really critical part of why simulation is needed. Um, that you're making changes to your training data sets, and the black box is being, uh, you know, the neural, the neural network, uh, it's not completely well understood the training data, uh, how, how that affected the results of the changes to your machine uh, learning algorithm. So you have to take a very comprehensive uh, 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 testing approach to this, and simulation is a very much a key part of this. Um, so I want to start to set the basis for how big of a multi-dimensional problem this is. This is three by three, but it's you know it's factors of n. Uh, it's it, it, this is a very large space of all the different variables that you have in play, and uh, traditional simulation just can't handle this. To be able, you need, need to be able to take Monte Carlo-based simulation. Uh, Google calls this concept fuzzing. Another uh, thing from the car craft article, but you need to be able to take all the different variables in play, and you're not just testing for one specific scene, but you're testing for uh, performance boundaries all around that. So changing various variables and seeing what the impact and results of that, and you can learn so much more about your system and test for regressions. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about our, our offering. I'm going to be showing a lot of different videos uh, that you're going to see tonight. Um, and those are all coming from our test program. 
And that is our ability to run those millions of tests in a cycle. That's scalable on-demand simulation priced by the simulation hour. Thus, our simulation as a service model uh, gets away from the old style of enterprise licensing. If you find the traditional, uh, if you find the traditional simulators, allows companies to get started earlier, stick their toe in the water before making a big, uh, you know, making a big, large commitment. Um, our scenario designer is our test development tool for building the tests that you're going to see, uh, building both tests and training data collection exercises. Uh, you're going to see our test runner, which is uh, used for analyzing the test results. And then we're providing uh, scene and scenario packs. So, so far, uh, Metamodo has taken a very lean startup approach. Uh, so what we have, these, these various tools are not generally available to the public, yet we have have various early engagement uh, customers that we're working with of various flavors, OEM, Tier 1, Rideshare, uh, various sensor companies, uh, sensor ecosystem is extremely important, and then also stack providers. And uh, really mastering, making sure that, that these work and they're solving problems for all of these different types of customers. We've got those early engagements going on right now, and then we'll be making some announcements later this year for uh, bringing the rest of this out <coughs> to, uh, to everybody else. Um, yeah. So here is our first simulation. So here's a scalability example. Ability to run one test, interested. It's taking that test and running it in many different ways. And to be able to identify those performance boundaries, finding key edge cases, I'm going to give some examples of this. So here we're giving uh, examples of changing weather, time of day, road conditions. Um, if you look, you know, very detailed. These are these are small, uh, but you can definitely see the different variations and the results of the tests are very different. So here are some parameter examples of, of you know, obviously environmental factors like road conditions, traffic lane markings, uh, but then going beyond that, also being able to change the hardware factors at uh, various failures, introducing uh, noise, dirt on, on sensors, uh, bird poop, for example. Uh, things that you would commonly find out in the environment and introducing those. And then you're not only just changing those, uh, those external factors, you're also uh, changing things like sensor settings, controller settings, uh, vehicle properties, using the simulation for optimization purposes. So here's an example of changing road conditions. So we're not only changing the, uh, the physical properties on the road, you're going to see potholing, tar snakes, uh, we're changing the lane markings, puddling, uh, but we're also changing the material properties, and those have distinct effects on uh, the various sensors. So sensors is what we're going to be talking about next. Here's a video that we did with Quantergy at CES that uh, they had this running in their booth next to the Fisker. So that, that was, you know, but, but we still got a lot of we still got a lot of looks for this, so that was good. Um, this is showing their S3 lidar, uh, their solid state lidar. They've got six of them on here. This is an example of for them creating a very specific sensor model. So we're supporting lidar, GPS, radar, IMU, camera uh, at this time. Um, you can set various uh, you can set the sensor settings according to spec sheets. But more importantly, you can create your own specific models that will leverage the actual source code and the firmware uh, that you can bring into the cloud and get more specific sensor models, which is extremely advantageous using LiDAR, uh, yeah, using LiDAR, basically ray tracing type services to uh, simulate some of the beam, uh, beam activities. So here's another example uh, that we did at CES with MetaWave. Um, this, was, this was great. Uh, probably many of you know the difficulties, the complexities of radar. Uh, doing that, it, that's a very exhaustive simulation. It takes a very long time to do it very precisely. 
Most groups do simulation with object lists. Uh, MetaWave is taking a new beam forming approach with radar, very thin, thin beams, making it much more LiDAR-like. Not only is it more advantageous to be able to model and simulation, but it's also uh, it's also proving to be a very uh, superior technology in the aspect of putting 50 radars out on the road, the interference that that causes, that's not really sustainable for autonomous systems. Um, and accordingly, everybody's learning that, and a company like MetaWave is coming forward with this new radar approach, which we think is gonna be very effective. What's, what's great is that we've been able to model this and provide this new model of radar in our simulation in a straightforward fashion. So here's an example of ground truth. Uh, so not only using, uh, we know everything in the virtual environment and everything is labeled, everything is tagged. You could pull data sets out of the environment. I gave you an example earlier for machine uh, learning training purposes. You can use it for various algorithmic uh, verifications. Uh, everybody is using, you know, there's numerous uh, label, data uh, uh, labeling companies that are out there that are exist, the need for this is very great. It's another great application simulation. So now I'm getting into, uh, we're gonna introduce here for the first time that we haven't shown this you know, publicly to an audience yet. This is our test run. This is our cloud environment uh, for running those tests. Red is, here's all of our different test suites. Red is that one or more tests uh, failed. Green is that they all passed. Orange is that we're some type of stop condition. You can see the various test history for your different uh, for your different test suites. Give examples of that. So, what introduces the concept in in our world? Test suites are made up of test vectors. Think of test vectors as highly parameterizable uh, tests. And you can set various parameters and then run that test in different ways, very vectorized. You know, thus the word vector. So here's the next video. I'm going to give an example. So here we're going to do our first example. We're going to do this urban training test suite. Uh, everything, uh, the test suite, here, here's an example of the REST API and the REST integration. You can use our web UI. You can equally use it uh, in your continuous integration environment, never opening the test interface. So here's an example of a single test vector. This suite is just a single test vector. You can have suites with many, many test vectors, um, but we're, taking a very, we're giving very simple examples here. And here's an example of us running it and showing then that uh, the simulation is run. Okay, so here is our results analyzer. Uh, and here's an example. Here is the, that urban training, uh, th that urban training simulation. So, fully dockable windows. Here we're breaking out the various sensor views. We have our log messaging on the right side, lidar controls up above. Hitting pl hitting play on this. Uh, I'm going to walk through. The, we're showing the various variables in the in the scene. Now, imagine in time, uh, you know, one of the ways forward for us is that we want to provide in this tool even more visibility in the stack. So that's, uh, you know, in a future expansion of this. Everything is fully scrubbable. Uh, we can jump to various points along the graph. We can jump to various log messages. You can envision in time that this is going to be more tightly integrated with various debuggers and development tools that autonomous systems developers are using. Here's an example of our LiDAR view. We're changing the, uh, we can change the history on it. We can also change the window centering. Uh, so I've set it now that it's only showing the LiDAR, uh, the, the LiDAR in the view bar. It, it, yeah, so it's only showing the LiDAR in the past. Uh, you, can, you can move those windows around uh, to view in the future and, and, and move back in the past. Um, that's the advantage of the simulation. And, uh, you know, here we're stopping for a pedestrian. That controller does a good job of, of obeying uh, pedestrians moving around. So there's the first example. So we use this, this exercise. We grabbed training, uh, tra training data. So let me give an example. 
of this. So here's uh, an extracted results file from this, whereas Here's the various sensor views. You can envision that this was a folder of PNGs uh, that you could use for various purposes. We've encoded this for presentation purposes. Here's an, another example. You know, here's the ground truth data for being able to pull out various data sets. We're collecting all of the LiDAR point cloud data. Right, so here's another uh, scenario. I probably saw that on the list. Here's a two trucks scenario operating in a range showing LIDAR, uh, a scenario where we're going between two trucks. And you'll see, you'll notice at the last minute the, the truck in the rear is going to merge uh, at, at the end. We're showing different views here. You're going to see another view behind the car. Uh, good example of weather conditions. Uh, you can see good, uh, you know, photorealistic scene. <laughs> Very reminiscent of 280. So here's uh, another example uh, us running. Uh, <laughs> the blind left turn. So in this test vector, this test vector is parameterized with six uh, different tests that you can change the various tests. The check boxes that are fixed or fixed values unchecked, those are variables. We're going to run the tests over all the variables. The idea here is the car is turning left. It cannot see the autonomous system, and we see how the autonomous system reacts on that. So we're running that test. <laughs> Here are those running tests. And then here's an example of uh, when the test is finished. There's been one failed test, five pass tests. We're going to look at a couple of those. We have thumbnails for the end results. So you, know, you get an idea before you click into something or want to view it. You get a good idea, hey, this is how this finished. Is this something that I might be interested in looking at? So that's provided as uh, a, an option. And here is, here is the passing test. So it's passed the car, and then we can go back and very carefully analyze step by step, what happened and what the uh, various variables are. And then uh, here is the failing case. So this is in the rain. Uh, typical of night rain. It's very hard. To, it's hard to see, but you can see the drops uh, coming down. This does fail, and there's very, very subtle differences uh, that we've identified. A performance boundary here caused by the rain and its effect on our perception stack that the braking does not happen fat, uh, fast enough, um, and you can go back and analyze why that is. So there's some very uh, distinct uh, examples of our uh, simulation as a service and the uses for that. Um, again, uh, you know, to tack to tack on on the end of this, we're I mentioned that simulation will ultimately become a standard, and you know, Medmoto is looking to contribute to a lot of those standards exercises, working with various groups. Um, but we're kind of at this point overall uh, with all autonomous systems. You probably all saw the article yesterday uh, talking about HD maps and the differences, the, the wide differences that there are. 
HD Maps is another example. Uh, we were very affected by this uh, for simulation. A lot of simulations, uh, we bring in Open Drive, we bring in other HD mapping sources. Uh, but even within simulation, uh, Open Drive is changed in so many ways uh, that the tagging is not necessarily adequate enough. And every group goes forward and makes their own changes. I, I acknowledge that we're in seemingly a time of a lot of companies that are competing against each other, but there's probably more advantage for collaboration to move the industry forward overall. And uh, you know, we as Metamoto, if there's any way that we can help contribute to that, um, providing simulations, sharing models, uh, for instance, is uh, something that's at the essence of what we're trying to do, providing collaborative environment for training and testing. And so uh, if, if there's an opportunity uh, for us to collaborate with you, um, I've got my business cards uh, here. Uh, come meet me afterwards and you know, we'd love to meet you and love to have a conversation. We have brochures over there and those run out. I'll get, I'll get more. Um, but we're really excited. Um, this is a tremendous time for the industry and it's a tremendous time to be part of this and seeing autonomous systems now, you know, being deployed for the first time in the excitement of what is going to happen over the next few years. And then the opportunity to be a part of this is, uh, is, is truly fantastic. So thank you uh, very much. Here's my contact uh, information, contact information for the company. Uh, don't be shy. And I would love an opportunity to answer a few questions. Right here, round of applause for <laughs> So, um, if, you, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand, and I'm going to bring you the mic. And then, so make sure, Chad, make sure you look for the person with the mic. Okay. So, in the scenario of uh, the rain, the accident occurs. Is there any heat map? Heat sensors can be uh, used to detect the heat of uh, the engine, so we can avoid that way uh, in the rainy situation. Yes. So there's no heat sensors in that example. But ultimately, uh, the more accurate your models and the sensors that you use, ultimately, we want the sensors to include every sensor that's being involved. That we want the, these uh, simulations to be a true replica of the autonomous systems. So yes, uh, and building these simulations is a very iterative approach. Uh, Opdal's law-ish, uh, in, in a sense, that uh, you're looking for the next uh, important set of things that are going to make your simulation better. It would be very interesting to see, uh, you know, the heat sensors impact. There's Stephen over there. Yeah, it seems that the viability of this approach is critically dependent on a super high fidelity representation of the physical phenomenology of the sensors. You talk about firmware and software and all those things, but if you don't have a proper representation of the physical phenomenology, you're nowhere. So how do you capture the effects of all the environmental conditions on the physical behavior of those sensors to have a, a sensor model that you really be trusted? Yeah, so uh, you know, one of the advantages, uh, in one of the game-changing technologies, per se, uh, coming into this was use of gaming engines. And use of technologies like physics, very accurate colliders, um, that there was a lot of capability that was generally available uh, that, you know, that being moved, uh, used in movies and, and whatnot, uh, it, it's not, it was not perfect. But it allowed us to have a basis to at least address a basic capability for all these different phenomena. And also, you know, we're, you, we're leveraging existing technologies like packages like CarSim, uh, packages that, you know, vehicle dynamics packages. There's some very, very good, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm not, not like that's not relevant. I mean, the question is, the five... if you're going to have something that's going to get to 99 and eight nines reliability and to represent that accurately, You've got to have way beyond car sim in terms of sensor representation. 
where are the imperfections in the sensor and how it uh, doesn't respond so well under certain rain conditions or certain fog conditions. If you don't have that represented, then you have no way of validating safety. Okay, so uh, are you addressing the environmental conditions or are you addressing the actual models, the very specific sensor models? It's the combination of those, how right. those sensors behave under all of those different environmental conditions with just the wrong sun angle, where the sun glints off something and trips your image processing and then thinking the situation is different from what it really is. How do you capture that really fine-grained behavior or imperfections in the sensors? So my answer to that is simply that you're improving each part. You're applying models to every single piece, and you're trying to most accurate, accurately represent each specific piece. And we have accurate models for all of these different pieces. And the question is, is what part of it is the low-hanging fruit that's the most important to improve next? And we're continuously asking ourselves that question. And we're making iterative, iterative changes. And what's interesting, what's surprising, is the parts that don't matter. Um, like, for instance, to give an example, it's our assertion that you don't have to get far off the road for the buildings to not matter. I mean, think about when you're driving around. Do you really care about that building 10 feet to the left? Unless it's reflecting a beam, have highly reflective material, and it's getting in your eyes, it generally doesn't matter. So it's a constant question of what's really important versus what's not important and modeling those pieces very accurately. Okay, I got a line of like five questions coming up, but you go first in the front and then we'll work our way around. Everybody. Yeah, first of all, like really great presentation, inspiring work, so thanks for that. And I had actually two related questions. One was, uh, so what gaming engine do you use and is it like ray trace versus uh, like a rasterized thing? And the second question was, suppose I'm like a LiDAR vendor and I have my LiDAR packet format. So what do we need to do to we just come to you, give you our packet format, and you do what's the, what's the relationship and the flow like? So Yeah, so we're using the Unity gaming engine. Um, you know, you hear lots of uses of Unreal uh, Unity. It's our assertion that, again, you know, going back to that comment earlier, uh, starting out with any one package, it's not going to be the solution for you. You have to iteratively improve it and get down to you know, core models and improve each asset and get it very precise and very specific. Um, but nevertheless, there's really no limits to the fidelity of the simulation uh, in both cases. And, uh, and, and you know, we're providing you various services to say point beam at a certain location, shoot it, here is your returns and then we're providing those to you. And you know, you're doing all of the sensor controls of that. It's REST-based uh, APIs that you can use for all of that. You wrap all your code in uh, networked APIs, and that's how you leverage those various pieces. And you can completely take advantage of you know, every element in the system. Does that answer your question? OK. Are you looking at potentially modeling external data, for example, see-through video streaming from the vehicle in front, or uh, intersection radar, or uh, basic safety messages from DSRC? Yeah, so uh, are, are you asking V2X? Yes. Exactly, yes. Yes, the answer, the, the answer is yes. We don't, we don't currently support that. Um, it's an inter V2X is at an interesting time in place itself for all. Um, no, but it, it, we've, we've designed the system to be able to support V2X. We don't support it currently, but no, we definitely see applications like we would see that as a direction. We're doing video streaming and everything, especially high bandwidth. Exactly. Let me go back there. Yeah, of so are there scenarios you can't simulate? And secondly, are there scenarios you don't want to simulate because of accuracy? Again, again, uh, there's scenarios that we currently probably cannot uh, simulate accurately yet. Maybe an example was the sensor uh, idea, you know, 
know, if, uh, if a burning car were to have some effect uh, somewhere on the road, we probably wouldn't accurate, uh, accurately model that today. But in time, the overall, in the grand scheme of things, uh, if there's a physical model you know, uh, available for it, then I see no reason we could accept it. Thanks, Chad, for the presentation. Maurice Godel. I come from the area which Robert said, traditional simulation. So I try to understand your offering. You're uh, very interesting. You're offering uh, a very vertical solution for a problem we have. You mentioned you have the scenario designer and scenario pack. Uh, which of these two parts of the program you have uh, uh, is a type of a unique value proposition of the solution you have and set you apart from the other companies which offer similar solutions? But, and the second part is, I can't imagine if you walk into an OEM, automotive OEM, they have their own bits and pieces. How open is your platform to integrate their part of the things in your solution? So I'll, uh, I'll address those in order. So you know, what, what are the pieces that, uh, you know, even before I say this, and this is the part that I wanted to say earlier in the presentation that I didn't say. Uh, Hardware in the loop and uh, simulation of physical testing are not going away. This is not. This this is what we believe a very new piece to the overall uh, the, the overall workflow and life cycle that autonomous systems think brings new problems. So uh, we're you know we very much hope to sit along uh, to the side of existing hardware in the loop simulators and that there's real opportunities there. Um, we've been inspired, so what, what you didn't see tonight was you didn't see our scenario designer. Uh, because it's not done yet. It's a set of internal tools, and we're mastering that. There's a lot of things that we've been very inspired by in terms of good scenario design for existing, uh, for existing software packages. Um, but you know, our focus and emphasis of scenario design is just very simple ease of use that you're providing all of the key variables that you do need to expose for the simulation, but that you're doing it in a very modern, uh, non-complex approach. Uh, you know, snapping, taking, taking you know, very easily that you have a car moving with this pedestrian, and that they have associations, and you spoke your timing specific events. You know, those are the types of things that we're looking to master. And that we're mastering, and that is going to be available in our rooms. Uh, so now, to your second question, uh, in terms of an open arc, this is very much an open architecture uh, that's designed with lots of lots of APIs. I, I think you'll find that we're using various modern cloud approaches that you would find on AWS, Azure. Uh, Google Cloud, where we've designed our system to be cloud agnostic as possible. Although everything that you saw here was on the Amazon, uh, was was on AWS, um, and then ultimately supporting uh, private clouds too. Uh, that, you know, that we designed all of these uh, things in a fashion to, to support that. So I hope that answers and and be able to bring in you know using your API, our various APIs. Uh, you could bring in any part of your code, running in its native uh, form, and leveraging that in our environment. Thanks, Chad. Yes. Well, my understanding is basically your, your solution is tagging to the health systems that we stay, very stand, those that are the health systems that we use. Yes. I, I, the, the, the Simulink models, too, of the past yeah, yeah. are not necessarily going away. We have mechanisms to support them. And uh, so, yeah, to be interoperable is very, very important to us. Thank you. Here again, Brad. Yeah, so most people are doing most of their simulation post-perception over here. Thanks. But you seem to talk mostly about pre-perception simulation here. I assume that is your focus still. Uh, I agree with Steve. I thought your, uh, your pre-perception uh, sensor models were very video game, right? Not realistic at all in the sense that they're very uh, ultra-realistic, uh, synthetic. And so I was curious about something that you said, uh, that you thought you would extract training data from this. Are there people who want to actually train on the very artifact-heavy output of a simulation? That is a fantastic question. <laughs> and uh, 
And the answer is yes. Um, we uh, very much acknowledge uh, the, the photorealistic improvements that need to be made to be able to do that. Um, there's a lot of question, there's a lot of open questions and a lot of open uh, proof of concept activities going on right now on uh, how good your environment needs to be to be able to uh, train against it. Uh, so yeah, so I will openly acknowledge uh, that we have you know, provided a framework for, for training data. And we've made great photorealistic uh, improvements to our scenes and we're continuing to do so. And there's a lot of exciting machine learning techniques that allow for doing that. But yes, there's still a lot of open questions there. Now, there's, now, there's one particular thing I would ask as well with the liner. Real liner might not so look like what you showed them. They, uh, they're distorted because the sensor is moving, the vehicle is moving, it's a scanning device and so on. Uh, and that requires extremely high trim rate to do with proper accuracy. So uh, what do you do for that? Yeah, so uh, you know, one, of the, one of the challenges and one of the interesting things that we're working out right now is a lot of the sensor companies, their, uh, their algorithms are very proprietary. You know, what, what makes uh, various beam patterns distinct for different sensor companies is different. And this is part of providing an open architecture. I'm not, I'm not going to say that in showing my videos that I'm going to have the best view of that sensor, but the sensor manufacturer that's using our software is. So uh, it's, it's one of those things. And then they're going to share their models with their, with, with their OEM. So uh, you know, I, I'm not making claims here that everything that we're doing is absolutely, uh, with the simulations that I'm showing, you know, identifies with, you know, this is exactly, for instance, how the Velodyne sensor works. Now, Velodyne, in, in the future, they partner with us to allow us to provide their algorithm in this system, whereas at that point, I would be probably be showing uh, simulations that look exactly more like a Velodyne sensor. So I hope that answers your question. Sure. All right, um, if you wouldn't mind introducing yourself before asking your question, uh, that request yeah. is not a bad idea. Okay, my name is Herbert Yan, I'm a co-founder of Uh Thank you very much for the presentation. So I've been looking at this um, simulation and connecting to some of the questions answered about uh, how reliable is the sense of performance, uh, which can track back to the simulation, but you have an alternative world of digital mechanics where we have a different kind of simulation tying back to the physical world, and there's a lot of opportunity to get actual metrics of the sense of behavior through the I systems, and now I was thinking in a platform like Unity, uh, you have the opportunity to plug in your machine learning agents through TensorFlow, things like that, so have we thought about it, or, or is there an opportunity to tie back that information, the model metric, the parameter models, back to your Unity platform, if I have my own TensorFlow trained model based on physical Yes. Yeah. So uh, you, when you, you know, do these presentations, you have a, uh, a goal to address all of these various things, and then you always find you know, one thing that you didn't, uh, that you didn't mention. And, Validation is a very, very important part of all of this. Creating sim this, this uh, uh, goes back to the gentleman's question here. If the simulation doesn't match real world results, then it's garbage. So what, you're, what you need to do, and to, to do, we're doing this with various sensor companies, is pairing these with validation programs that they're doing exercises in a, phys in, a phys in a location, and they're collect doing various data collects. And we simulate those exact tests that we're doing and cross-correlating those results and tweaking the sensor model until it matches those results. And the more extensive that is, the more that you have faith that the simulation is doing a good job of modeling your sensor. And uh, that is, we want to find various partners for this. You know, this is an area that we re we recognize that we need. That's very important. That we talk to various groups about. Uh, this is one of those opportunities for collaboration. Uh, 
Robert over here proposes uh, is often touting this open sensor uh, model and approach for this very principle. For this very principle, um, and it's our thesis that if you're providing very accurate sensor models and you're and you're putting those into the system and 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 the various other pieces that you have to do the same type of validations against, then when you're doing your simulations at scale, that you're providing useful results. Dean, uh, so let, me give you, let me get Dean go first. I got your hand. Uh, Dean, we want my uh, X aerospace flight control simulation engineer transitioning to this space. And I think you might have just answered the question I was going to ask about verification validation. Uh, sounds like for the sensor, you're, you're working with your partner to do the verification validation. Then, what does that leave for Menomoto in terms of your simulation framework? Can you discuss is there other verification you have to do that? Sure, yes. I think there's always uh, you know, verifications. If you, do, if you do verifications on your seeds, that uh, you know, core seeds are, are accurate you know, representations of the real world. Um, that you're doing, you know, that you're approving and doing validations of all the different components. An example, an example, right? You're having a good tire model. You'll see groups like FKA that, uh, you know, if you ever visit facilities, they have all of these different parameter tests where, you know, they're but they're bouncing the tire or they're, you know, running various friction models and they get extremely accurate models of the of that. You know, you ultimately, you need validation partners to do those various tests that we're bringing parameters into our simulation environment that are representative of their, of their real world. So there's always going to be that type of work. And the scale of this, you know, providing simulators that can be able, that are capable of running millions of tests, it's a, it, it, and at the scale of this, it's going to be never ending fast to, you know, keep on that. But yeah, so there's there's opportunities in all these different spaces. I have two questions. My name is Sita Ram. I'm a hardware engineer, so this is very new to me. Uh, first question is, you validate all this, um, you run your verification on AWS, and then, but in an autonomous vehicle, it has to run on the actual platform yes. uh, with the actual real-time OS and so on and so forth. How do you make sure that your simulation results, which say that things are fine here, will actually be fine on a platform that actually goes in the vehicle. And again, this returns to what I said, what I was saying earlier. Physical testing and hardware and the testing doesn't go away. It still continues to be a key part of the workflow. And in this, uh, we're running our simulations on our cloud. We're running many sensors. You're trying to get very high fidelity. We don't have real-time here. Uh, in our environment, we're stepping our simulations. Um, it's it's a different problem, uh, frank, frankly, and you need to be able to test all of those different variations. The second question about dynamic events, like you know, I'm driving the debris on the road flies into the street, you know, windscreen, you know, windshield, or you have falling tree branches or something. Uh, can you have scenario engines create those kind of Yes. Yes. Okay, we're probably have time for one or two more questions. I apologize if I missed you. I was trying to keep the queue going in my head, and so if I did, don't don't take offense, please. Um, one or two more questions. All right. And if you could introduce yourself, if you don't mind. Hi. Hi, my name is Jason from Compound Eye. Uh, great presentation. Uh, getting back to this question of uh, getting proprietary information out of the uh, sensor vendors, there's 25 to 30 LiDAR startups now. There's only one LiDAR company that matters right now, but <laughs> there's another 25 startups. How many of those have you onboarded or do you expect to onboard in the next 12 months and have models of their sensor? We're, we're, we're working with it. LiDAR specifically. At this time, they, there's a lot more to do. Uh, it's going to be interesting. I mean, the lighter space, there's going to be a ton of consolidation. It's an interesting, uh, you know, world, world right now. No, but we openly acknowledge that I mean, it's going to take time uh, for support adoption. But here we have a system that's not even released yet. 
So, you know, not every central company has access to it to be able to support it yet. But uh, that we, you know, hope that as we release that we gain more adoption in that community. Um, there's also going to be, you know, we, we hope that there's going to be areas that are going to come forward more interoperable, more interoperable sensor standards, types of things that we're interested in working with and adopting that are going to promote that. That, you know, that would, so, you know, you're not necessarily locked into our environment, that there's lots of simulation environments that would be able to support. So those are things that we're looking at in early days. Okay, we're, we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Um, round of applause again for Chad. Thank you very much. You, you, you get an extra gold star because we had both Stephen Schladover and Brad Templeton asking you hard questions, which gets earned you an extra gold star. It's always great to have you here. Um, but thank you again, and we got you a uh, your very own Nissan shirt. So thank you very much. Um, so, Chad, you can stay around for a little while. If you have other questions, you're welcome to go up and chat with me a little bit. Yep. Thank you.